Well, good morning. It is so good uh, to see you here today. I know we've still got some folks traveling uh, for the holiday, uh, so uh, always need to keep those in our prayers. It'll be good when we get the whole family uh, back together. We we'll also have a, uh, quite a few folks that are, are out sick. Uh, make sure you get your, your bulletin. There's uh, people we need to be praying for in there, but uh, it is cold, flu, and pneumonia season, and uh, we have some, some folks. I know Jean Johnson is out with pneumonia this morning, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, also, Doris Buckner, uh, she uh, had some time in the hospital on Friday with an irregular heartbeat. She is back home now, but uh, please keep her in your prayers. Uh, I've got a little bit of news on Andrew Solomon. This is uh, Ruth Roberson's dad. He is improving some. Uh, he still has quite a few hurdles uh, to go through, but uh, keep him in your prayers because there is some improvement there. And uh, as you are, were made aware on Wednesday night, Linda Ravenel's great aunt uh, passed away. Uh, that funeral will be tomorrow at 11 o'clock in Macon. And she was 97 years old, so she lived a good, good long life. If you are here this morning and you are a visitor, man, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you being here. Uh, if we haven't already had a chance to shake your hand and say hello, give us that opportunity before you leave today. Another thing you could do to help us out is fill out an attendance card that you see there in front of you. You can just place that in the collection plate when it's passed uh, so we can have a record of your attendance. Members, it would be a great idea for you to do that as well. If you have small children, we have an attended nursery uh, and we also have a quiet room at the back of the auditorium. Uh, one of our ushers can help you locate that if you are unaware of where that is. Uh, it's also a good time if you haven't already silenced your cell phone uh, to do that. At this time, let's make sure our hearts and our minds are in the right place to worship God. And we're going to start that uh, by the reading of God's Word. Good morning. I'll be reading from Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 17. Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 through 17, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are, who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetable seed and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days it was seen that they were better in appearance and, and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As these four use, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in visions and dreams. Good morning. Technology is great, right? Until it's not. We're going to be using our books this morning. Our first song is number 813. Eight, one,
Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for this opportunity we have to come study thy word, and we pray that you'll be with David this morning as he brings, brings us the lesson. Pray, honey, Father, you'll be with the sick, especially our sister Jean Johnson and our sister Doris Buckner. Restore them to their normal health, if, if it's your will. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our sister Jill Nash being with us here this morning. Be with her and David and restore them to their normal health also. Pray, Heavenly Father, you'll be with the ones that are traveling to give them a safe trip to and from. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our elders. Bless, bless you uh, help them with their duties as they oversee the flock here. Go with us now, Father, and we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Corinthians 11, 23. The Bible says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. At this time, I'm going to ask the men to come and we'll pray for the bread. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come. We thank you for this opportunity to remember a great sacrifice that your Son made on our behalf. And Father, I pray that as we are about to partake of this bread, we'll do it in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable unto thee. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
us pray for the fruit of the vine. Father, again, we approach the throne of grace, thanking you, Father, for the blood that was shed for on our behalf, that we may have access to thee, Father. And as we uh, partake of this uh, drink, Father, we pray that we'll do it in a manner that is acceptable unto thee. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. concludes the Lord's Supper. As we are about to give, I'm going to read the 1 Corinthians 16. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And then in Luke 6, 38, it says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measures pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured unto you again. Let us pray for the collection. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to show our heartfelt gratitude and our love for you for the great sacrifice of your son. And Father, we realize that we could never pay you back for what was done for us. But we ask, Father, that you would take this as a token of expressing our hearts to you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1 will be our text. We really won't go anywhere else, so just open to Daniel chapter 1, lay it there in your, your lap, and that will guide us in our study this morning. I want to piggyback on the lesson that I presented two weeks ago, December the 23rd. We went to Jeremiah 29, verse 11, where God told Judah, who was in Babylonian captivity, I know the plans that I have for you, plans of, of peace and not of evil, to give you a hope and a future. And we discussed the idea that they were in captivity because of their disobedience. And that was not God's plan. God's plan for them was for them to be faithful and after 70 years, God's plan for them was to come out of captivity, and he wanted them, once they came out, to be faithful. That was Jeremiah chapter 29. Last week, and Dave and I didn't talk about this, but last week, if you were here, Dave went to Isaiah 55, which is where I left off, and he went to Isaiah 55, where God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than yours. My ways are higher than yours. A and all of that tied together with the Babylonian captivity, Judah being in captivity. I'm going to piggyback off of that, and we're going to go to Daniel. Because you see, in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, God said, Judah, I want you to be faithful. You're in captivity because of your unfaithfulness, because of your rebellion. I want you to be faithful. But you see, they weren't all unfaithful. There were some that were, and we're going to look at one of those individuals this morning by the name of Daniel. There was never, as far as I'm aware, a point in Daniel's life where Daniel was unfaithful. Even at a very young age, he was faithful. But Daniel is having to go into captivity with all of Judah because of their unfaithfulness. So Judah or Daniel is carrying the consequence of everyone else's unfaithfulness to God. So this is what God wants. This is what God wants from every single person of Judah. But even now, still today, this is what God wants. People to be faithful. Now we're going to look at a teenager who was just that. Daniel is believed to be 17 years of age when we first start reading about him in Daniel chapter 1 when he was carried into Babylonian captivity. The Babylonian captivity came in three ways. The Babylonians came into Jerusalem and took the first wave. They went back to Jerusalem, they took a second wave. They left the poor people, but then they went back and they eventually, in a third wave, carried away the poor. Daniel is to believe to have been taken in the second wave, captive into Babylon. At 17 years old, here we read about Daniel's faith. Daniel chapter 1. When we think about Daniel, we really remember Daniel for three things. We remember Daniel for chapter 1, what we're going to talk about this morning, when he refused to eat Nebuchadnezzar's food. He's one of four. We're going to read about three others who did the same, but, but we remember Daniel for doing this. But we also remember Daniel from chapter 2, and his ability to reveal and interpret the king's dream. But then the third and probably the most popular reason that we know Daniel is Daniel chapter 6, Daniel and the lion's den. These are the three things out of Daniel's life that really stick with us and what we remember him for. But I want you to put yourself in Daniel's shoes this morning. Because you have to imagine everything that he is going through at 17 years old. Along with all of Judah. But Daniel, 
being faithful to God, how hard it must have been. You say, well, I would have been faithful too. But you see, Daniel was carried away from his home. What's your home like? A, p a place of refuge, peace, a place where you go at the end of the day to relax and to rest, a place of security for you, a place where you've been for I don't know how many years, but it's your home. This is your county. This is your state. This is your country. This is what you know. This is your culture. Imagine if you would being taken away from it. Not taken from a, a one state to another. No, taken to a completely different culture. Where their ways are not your ways. The language they speak is not your language. The way that they worship, their gods are not your gods. Everything is now different. You see, this is what Daniel is facing. Because Daniel is going to school to learn the ways of the heathen wisdom. Daniel 1, 3 through 4. He's having to go to their schools in a different land to learn their wisdom, to be taught by their instruction, to learn their ways. And if it helps you, think about going to an Islamic country. This is Daniel in a different country. But not only that, but he is having to wear a different name. It has gone out on my screen, so if I keep looking behind, it's just to see if it's where I need to be. But he's having a different name. You see, they took his name Daniel, and the king's going to change it. The king changes it to give honor to the king and the king's God. He goes from Daniel in verses 6 and 7 to Bel, uh, Belteshazzar, a heathen name. I love my name, David Garrison Gulledge. Might be a hard name to pronounce, Gulledge at least, but it's my name. It's my family name. Imagine somebody coming in and changing your name to give honor to them, their king, and their God. Daniel, your name's going to be changed. But you see, all of this, Daniel seemed to tolerate. But then when it came to eating the king's food, this is something that Daniel did not want to do. The first two issues he could have tolerated without serious issues and scruples, but the third he couldn't seem to tolerate eating the king's chosen diet. And we'll talk about a few reasons as to why, but before we proceed any further, you've got to put yourself where Daniel is. Everything's different. He's learning their language. He's learning their culture. He's going to their schools. His name is changed. Everything about his life is not what he wants it to be. He's in captivity. How easy would it be to give in? To just go along with them? To just worship their gods? To just bow down to their king? How easy would it be to just live in peace? And not be faithful to God? Daniel was a young man, but yet he had deep and relentless faith in God. Nothing was going to take this away from him. They can change his name. They can take everything that he owned away, but they cannot take away his faith. As a teenager, he had deep convictions for the truth. In Daniel 1 and verse 8, the phrase that Daniel purposed in his heart, that's a phrase that when we read it, it means along the same lines as Daniel made up his mind. He decided that he was going to remain faithful to God no matter what. He made his mind up. He purposed within his heart. 
And we see that as Daniel got older, he did remain faithful to God. There's never a point in Daniel's life that we read that he was unfaithful. Even in his later years, in Daniel 6, 4 through 5, and in verse 10, when we read about the king signing an ordinance that you cannot bow down and pray to any god but the king, Daniel goes back to his home later in life, bows down on his knees to pray to God, as he did every single day. They see him, they take him to the king, they put him in a den of lions. But yet because of God, uh, Daniel's faithfulness, God rewarded Daniel in life. God blessed Daniel's faithfulness. And everything that Daniel was and everything that Daniel exemplified in his life was exactly what God wanted for all of Judah. And so for just a few minutes this morning, let's look at the faith of a teenager. And by doing so, let's turn to the text and consider what the text has to say. And I thank Brad for reading the text. Because of that, we won't read it a second time. But we're going to start in verse 8, and we're going to dissect it and kind of talk about what is taking place here in Daniel 1, 8 through 17. When we look at the text, verse 8, we see Daniel's conviction. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Here's his conviction. He was not going to defile himself with the king's food. Why? That seems like a pretty strange thing to be convicted about, not, not eating the king's food. Why die on that hill? Why fight that battle? There's a couple of reasons why Daniel could have refused to eat the king's food. The first reason is that many meats in Babylon would have been unclean. In Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, a lot of the meats that they ate would have been considered unclean. A good source of protein, no doubt, but yet unclean to Jews. Babylonians would have eaten meats improperly prepared, Deuteronomy 14 and verse 21. But also they would have partaken of meats that they themselves offered to their idols and their gods. You see... Daniel is in a very, very idolatrous and heathen nation. Gods and idols all around, smaller, lowercase gods, all around. And these meats would have been offered to those gods. And that's why in Romans, Paul is later going to write that there is nothing wrong with the meat. If it's offered to idols, it's clean to eat, but not if it bothers your conscience. But here in Daniel's case, it could have been that he didn't want to eat meat offered to the Babylonian God. But another reason why Daniel could have refused to eat this diet is because it was the king's chosen diet. This is a diet that the king has specifically designed to make his Men, his soldiers, his warriors, as strong as possible. This is the diet that the king would have selected, knowing that this diet made his men big and strong. And so when Daniel refuses to eat the meat, good source of protein, and only vegetables, and at the end of it, Daniel is stronger than the men that had the protein. Who gets the glory? Not the king. Who can take vegetables over meat and make the men more fit and stronger? God can. And at the end of it, they're going to look at it and say, well, this isn't the king's diet, but it worked better. So who gets the glory? God gets the glory. Two reasons why perhaps Daniel refused to eat the king's food. 
But then we continue on. We see verse 8, his conviction. The latter part of, part of verse 8, the very latter part of verse 8 and verse 9, Daniel's challenge is to decline without offending the king. That's a challenge. Now, Daniel was going to be faithful no matter what, but if you offend the king, guess what? No longer are you going to be living on this earth because he's going to put you to death if you offend him. And so that was Daniel's challenge, not to offend the king. Daniel displayed no haughtiness, no rudeness, or radical, fanatic behavior. He was convicted, but he was not extreme. He was cautious. He knew that the way he behaved mattered. Yes, he was going to follow God, but he was not going to offend the king if at all possible. Sometimes people take their convictions and their not balanced and they go to one extreme or the other but Daniel was balanced in his convictions Daniel was not a coward who would not do anything but neither was he reckless in his actions and his decisions in verses 10 through 14 we see the commander and Daniel where Daniel and the chief of the eunuchs, the commander. Notice what he says in verse 10. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king. The commander feared the king. Daniel feared the king's God. That's who Daniel feared. Daniel feared Jehovah. In verses 15 through 17, we see that God is going to reward those because of their faith, Daniel and others. Notice verses 15 through 17. God is going to give them blessings, and he's going to reward them. Remember, they're in a strange land. How hard is it for you to learn another language? How, how hard is it to learn ways that are not your ways? But notice in verse 17, now again, Daniel's not alone. There's three other individuals. We know them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that was their given Babylonian name. Their, their given name was um, Hananiah, um, well, verse uh, eight, uh, 6, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That was their name, but their name was changed like Daniel's to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Daniel's not alone. There's three other individuals with him. But yet, Daniel is still perhaps the youngest and displayed a great sense of faith. But God's going to reward them, verse 17. And for these four men, God gave them knowledge and skills in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And so God blessed their faithfulness. God rewards those who are moved by faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, For without faith it is impossible to please God. For they that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so they're faithful, God rewards them. And he does the same for us today, in different ways, but yet he is still a rewarder. Daniel remained for more than 60 years faithful through several rulers, and at least two different empires. But that's a look at the text. Now let's look at Daniel's faith. What is it about Daniel's faith? Can we look at Daniel's faith, and can we look at different characteristics of that faith? At least three different characteristics can be seen in his faith, and the first is clarity. Do you have any doubt, reading about Daniel, where Daniel's faith lies? Do you have any doubt which God he worships? Is it blurry at all, Daniel's faith? You see, in the, the time and in the place in which Daniel lived, there was a lot of vagueness in his day. People that eh, perhaps they, they, they had, they were sitting on the fence, they, they, they believed in God, Jehovah God, but yet they bowed down to the idols in Babylon 
they weren't really faithful. They, they were just kind of vague. There were a lot of mixed superstitions, idolatrous systems. There were a lot of different things and a lot of different ways to live in that day. But, but when you look at Daniel's faith, Daniel's faith is so clear. You know where he stands. You know what his beliefs are. Because he made his mind up. He purposed in his heart the way that he was going to live and what he was going to do. He knew it in his head. He sowed it in his heart. He showed it in his life. And he sowed it in the world. There's no doubt in my mind Daniel's faith because of its clarity. But not only its clarity, its loyalty. Daniel wasn't loyal to God 90% of the time and then bowed down 10% of the time to the Babylonians. He was loyal. Faith in God in Babylon was unpopular. Daniel was in the minority. Living in Amer uh, America, being a conservative, being a Christian, we can understand what it feels like to be in the minority. The things that we believe, the things that we preach, the things that we teach are growing less and less popular. And they don't have to be popular, but they're right and they're true. And popularity doesn't make it right. But God makes it right. But Daniel was in the minority. But yet he was loyal. And Sunday only Christians are cowardly. We need to be loyal to God, Christ always. There's never a moment. There's never a second, there's never a day, there's never an hour, there's never a month, never a year that the Christian who proclaims Christ as their Savior needs to be unfaithful, unloyal to God. Not just Sunday morning. Sunday morning only Christians have no power. But only those who are loyal. Completely wholeheartedly given over to Christ because Christ is your power. But if you're only with Christ one hour out of the week, He's not really yours. And I don't want to be so harsh, but it's true. Christ wanted everyone to count the cost before they decided to follow Him. In the Gospel accounts, you can read about people that came to Him. One came to Him and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, I have no place to lay my head. The foxes have holes, the birds have nests, I, the Son of Man, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Jesus would later say, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You see, you've got to count the, the cost of following Christ. Daniel was loyal. But not only was his faith did it have clarity? Not only did it have loyalty, but it had fixity. It was fixed and unmovable. You weren't going to persuade Daniel to change. The, the majority of captives in Babylon, they, they did whatever the Babylonians required. When that trumpet sounded, they bowed down. But not Daniel. Not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were fixed. And even a fiery furnace wasn't going to change it. You ever been to a bonfire? I've been. In fact, when I lived in Paris, Tennessee, they, they claimed, Whitlock took the Christ, they claimed to have the world's biggest bonfire. Every year in November, they had a big bonfire, invited the whole community, and I'm going to tell you, if it's not the world's biggest bonfire, it, it, it's pretty close. They took whole trees and stacked them up and had a bonfire so big, you, you couldn't really even roast anything on it. It was just, you know, um, it was just there to look at. But it was so hot, you couldn't really get that close to it. Can you imagine a fiery furnace so hot that the men who threw them in died because of the heat? But not only that, 
not even that is going to move the faith of Daniel, Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah. They were fixed on the standards of God. Regardless of their environment, regardless of the custom, regardless of the values, they were fixed on God. You see, a Christian who is not fixed is very dangerous. In James chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, but let him ask in faith, not doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed. You see the opposite of fixed there? You're, you're, you're doubting and you're, you're, you're tossed like a wave of the sea. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways, James says. But when we look at Daniel, his faith was fixed. And it wasn't going to move. And so as we look at the faith of a teenager, and I got, I got to preaching and forgot to advance the PowerPoint. When we look at the faith of Daniel, I want you to dare to be a Daniel. I want you to dare to be a Daniel. When I was younger, middle school, high school, I had a hard time turning down a dare. There were some dares that I'm not proud of, and I'm not going to tell you what I did. If someone said, I dare you, it probably wasn't a very smart thing to do. But this morning, I'm going to dare you to be a Daniel. And it will be the smartest thing that you'll ever do in this life. Be a Daniel. And how do you do that? Verse 8 of chapter 1 again tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart. And so the way that you're going to be a Daniel is you've got to make your mind up. You've got to make the decision that no matter what comes in your life, you're going to be faithful to God. Your faith is going to be clear. Your faith is going to be loyal. Your faith is going to be fixed, no matter what. You see, faithfulness is not being faithful when things are going right. Faithfulness is not being faithful when you're in a pretty good situation. Faithfulness is being faithful to God and having your mind made up that no matter what, you're going to remain faithful. I want to dare you to be a Daniel. And I'm not daring you to be faithful to Sunday morning attendance. That's the easy part. Be a Daniel. Be strong. Rise up. Stand firm in the faith. Be loyal to God. Walk with God. Follow the footsteps of Jesus. Put on the whole armor of God every single day. Put on the fruit of the Spirit and the Christian virtues. Be sincere, be dedicated, be righteous, be convicted. But most of all, and in all things, even if you're standing alone, be faithful to God. Because I have to tell you that heaven will not come easily. Heaven is for those that walk the narrow path, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And the narrow path is straight, meaning that it's hard and it's challenging not popular, and few there be that find it. Be a Daniel. The faith of a teenager. When we see a teenager do things like this, it kind of hits us even stronger that someone so young could do something so great. But this lesson is for us all. I want to challenge you this morning, if you're not a Christian, to become one, to put him on in baptism, have your sins washed away. We can do that this morning. You probably hear the baptism up there, but it's ready. It's ready to go. We can baptize you this morning. You can be a Daniel. Make the day your day. Or maybe you are a Christian. You've wandered away. Maybe there's things in your life that have caused you to be unfaithful. And you realize that. And you know that. And you need to make things right. The invitation is yours as well. Publicly or privately, I want to encourage you to make your life right with God. And to be a Daniel every day that you live. The invitation is yours. Will you come as we stand and sing?
appreciate that. Encourage everybody to uh, come back today at 5 p.m. Dave Rogers will be back, and he will be uh, preaching tonight. So I look forward to seeing everybody back again. Visitors, don't rush off. Let us have an opportunity to get uh, to know you a little bit better. If you didn't already pick up a bulletin, make sure you do so. Lots and lots of things on our calendar coming up, as well as that lengthy uh, prayer list. Just want to mention just a few of those uh, on uh, the calendar that are coming up pretty quickly uh, that we don't want you to miss. First of all, on uh, Sunday, there will be a, uh, I'm sorry, on Saturday the 12th is our annual uh, Feed the Homeless. I'm going to go ahead and add and clothe the homeless uh, to that title. Uh, we will, a group, group of our, our young folks get on the bus along with several adults and head downtown. Uh, the bus will leave at 10 a.m. They'll distribute uh, sack lunches as well as coats, scarves, gloves, socks, blankets, uh, things like that. If you haven't already uh, emptied your closets, uh, make sure you do that. Bring, the, bring that in and just add it to the big giant pile in the office and our young folks will make sure that gets distributed to uh, very needy people. Also on uh, Sunday the 13th, uh, a, a new thing for our, our teenagers, something called Teen Sing will, uh, will uh, happen after the evening worship service at the Pelfrey's home. If you have any questions about that, uh, see David. And also he has asked me to uh, please uh, let our parents of teenagers uh, and young people know uh, that you need to sign up for CYC. This is Challenge Youth, Youth Conference. This congregation has gone to Challenge Youth Conference up in the Smoky Mountains for almost 20 years now. We have seen it grown to well over uh, 10,000 attendants uh, every year. This is like-minded young people that come together uh, to worship God, sing praises, have a great time. The Brotherhood's best speakers for young people are there each and every year. They, they, uh, they are, do a fantastic job. The singing is amazing, and you're in Pigeon Forge. You've got tons of opportunities to waste money. So I can't imagine why any teenager would not want to go. Uh, so please uh, sign up for that quickly. David needs to get uh, everyone registered for that. Again, if you have any questions on that, uh, see David, and he can answer those questions for you. All right, David asked me to mention that. Kristen has asked me to mention this. She's only asked me five times this morning not to forget to mention this. Uh, their upcoming wedding, uh, her and uh, David, uh, is scheduled for March 2nd, but she needs you to go online uh, to the knot.com and RSVP by the 20th. So please do so. Uh, she says the caterer has to have those numbers, and it is my job to make sure that you know uh, that they need that. And we knew this all along, but now it's official. Uh, Zane Poskovich is smart. He graduated from Georgia Tech, and we are excited about that. And uh, the family would love for everybody after service tonight to head over to the fellowship hall for a cake and ice cream to celebrate that great accomplishment. I think that is all I have on my list to mention. Rick Sharp has a brief announcement about the upcoming GSOP uh, classes. Then we'll have uh, one last song and prayer. I'll be very, very brief. I just want to encourage the congregation tomorrow we're going to be starting our GSOP classes, and I want to encourage each and every one of you to come out. Uh, we're going to be discussing biblical archaeology and, ge and geography of the Bible. Uh, these are some things that we don't get a chance to, to really talk about. As Dave was going through his lesson, I couldn't help but think about the customs that's going to be on Thursday night um, and the, and the uh, environment that existed between the Babylonians and the people of the Hebrew people. And so as we uh, think about some of these classes, the biblical archeology, span some of the things that's been discovered, uh, things that have been found over the years, these are some things that we may wanna look at and examine. 
We need to get a better feel for the geographical region of things that we study about uh, every time that we examine the Word of God. And I think that this will encourage us, help us to become better Bible students. So when we are out teaching and preaching the gospel to our friends and our family, we have a better idea of exactly who we're talking about and what we're trying to express to the people. So I want to encourage you to do what David said. Uh, be a Daniel, purpose in your heart uh, to come out to these classes and to support GSOP. Uh, thank you so much. Before we dismiss this morning, number 727. 727. We shall see the king someday. Oh, when we turn to remind us of another opportunity that's coming up and I certainly hope we'll all remember that works like this are opportunities. Uh, we have a, a trip we're going to be taking in July to a little town in Mexico where our, our goal will be to introduce that community to the gospel and save souls. We'll be doing a lot of work down there and this is an opportunity to have one of the best experiences that you will ever have. Uh, this is our own work uh, uh, organized and planned by this congregation. It's not one where another congregation is organizing it and we're invited to come along. We will have uh, people from other congregations, but this is a Fayetteville trip and we need uh, to know, uh, a, we need a commitment soon in order to, to finalize the planning and be able to tell the people who are interested how much it costs. So just a reminder that we need that commitment by the end of the month. We already have, I believe, 14 people who are uh, committed to go, and that's great. I'm really gratified, and the elders are by the young people who are going. Uh, and we would certainly be happy to have more young Christians who would like to do that. So if you're uh, able to, uh, just let it be known. We're asking for a $100 deposit, but we don't want money to, to borrow anybody who is really committed to going and wants to go. Uh, and speaking of commitment, we certainly want that for this trip and all of our works from everyone, and the way you can do that is primarily with your prayers. If you have extra money to donate to help pull this endeavor off because it is a big undertaking, well, those contributions are welcome always. But the purpose, again, is to introduce that community to the gospel and to fire up, really, those who take part, as mission trips always do, to come back home and help us work harder to introduce our own community to the gospel. Let's not forget those opportunities that we all have every week, including the one coming up in a few hours, to get together again at 5 o'clock to worship at a time when most of our friends and neighbors will not be doing that. Thank you for all of those who are visiting today. It's really great to see this auditorium so full, and we do hope that you've met a lot of friendly people, and that if you have any questions about what we do and why we worship as we do, you'll feel free to ask somebody. As we depart, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all of your blessings and for this day and for all the souls here who have come because they want to love you and do what you want us to do. Help us to be better in our efforts to do those things. Please be with us for the rest of this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.